For over 20 years, Google has been protecting Americans from cybersecurity threats, from turning two-step verification on by default for 150 million people, which adds an additional layer of account security with a single tap, to protecting news sites and human rights organizations with Project Shield. Google is building advanced technologies that raise the bar for the entire industry and makes the whole Internet safer for everyone. Learn more about how Google is keeping more Americans safe online than anyone else at safety.google. Open your hearts, loosen your butts. It's time for couples therapy. Yeah, this podcast is Andy and Naomi's, where they can both laugh and hang with all their homies, talking excellent vacationing with brunches and cuddling, to messy situations, shits and conscious and coupling, from Netflix hookups to single them with some Hulu, text sex regrets, so feeling on your new jubu. They gon' talk about it, ah, yeah, you are invited, ah, needing therapy, I guarantee, baby, we got it. It's up, up, up. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Couples Therapy. My name is Naomi. My name is Andy. And we're a real-life couple. A real-life couple of comedians. And on Couples Therapy, we answer a couple of different questions from a couple of different listeners. Coming to you on a Sunday fun day. You would not have known from the excitement in my voice that just moments ago, I was asleep on the couch with Mabel draped over me. You would never have guessed. I know. You've what? come alive. You're electric, even. What a professional I am. <laughs> Oh, this is a fun episode. So I think that's what makes me um, a little energized because I was like thinking back to the app and I was like, this is a real fun one. This is a fun episode. We have a lot of fun episodes coming up. This has been a fun week. We, mm -hmm. Naomi, you were in a, a Netflix movie. Yes, I have a little part in a Netflix film called Me Time. And we did attend the premiere, if you will, <laughs> the premiere. And we'll get into that in all its glory uh, and opposite of glory uh, on the Patreon. No That's opposite what, of glory. It was fun. It was. But then we had that little end of the night incident. And so I will be bringing that to the page. Okay? Oh, <laughs> I'll be bringing it to the page. I, I forgot about that. I have not. Because, you know, y'all, I like to hold on to a resentment. Okay, so that, w you can go to patreon.com slash couples therapy pod if you want to hear me ranting and raving in the next couple days. No press, but $5 a month, you get two bonus episodes, and honey, I do spill tea. <laughs> By the way, hey, also, uh, if, you, if you don't have $5 a month, uh, you can rate and review the show for free. That Costs really, you nothing, takes 10 seconds. That really does help. It really does, because you get them ratings, you get those reviews, obviously only good ratings and only good reviews <laughs> okay <laughs> it's like not where you want to put your anonymous feedback <laughs> okay uh but you get it there that bumps us up it gets us on the list honey we start charting people know we exist that's what it's all about right just wanting people to know you exist that's <laughs> life in a nutshell but Naomi, how does it feel to be in a top 10 netflix movie that's not the gray man <laughs> uh it feels fine i feel i feel nothing <laughs> I feel nothing. Hey, is that not modern life? <laughs> exactly. I feel nothing. Wanting to be acknowledged and feeling nothing. Mm. Dark, dark, dark. We are goofing. Hey, speaking of wanting to be acknowledged, we have some comments. We have some updates. Okay, we have to acknowledge. Uh, I just want, because we have updates, I don't want to, we, we have, a, we had a lot of comments. Okay. And a, a lot of things, but I, I don't think we have the time. We don't. Not enough hours in the day. But everyone, I want you to know, I listened to all of your comments from... Bow to stern. <laughs> okay. From tip to tail. So you are acknowledged. You you do exist in the Cartesian sense. <laughs> but uh, very quickly. So do you remember Steph's episode, Autumn in Cleveland? Yes. Right? Do you yes. remember she wrote in her friends are all like booed up? And yes. They, the, and she feels lonely in yeah. Cleveland. She's moved back in with her parents, right? Yeah. A number, more than one, uh -huh. a number of people have wrote in to say, hey, they also live in or around Cleveland. Ooh. And are lonely. So of okay. Autumn, yeah. if you want me to connect you... We're, look, we're not Hinge. I, I'm, we're not Hinge. Not, we're not. not a service But this is about offering. friendship. This is about friendship. And I will say that we have made a lot of beautiful friendships, Andy. The CTQC... Yes. They visit each other across the country. Yes. They're crossing, like, country lines, even. So, okay? Autumn, write in 
you know, DM or whatever if you want, and I will connect you with these people that are also looking for friends in Cleveland. Yeah, and you can like just have them, you know, you can just give us a social media handle if you want them to just like DM you that way so you don't have to give out your personals. There are ways no, if no. you want. Phone number and social security <laughs> number. Routing number. Routing number. <laughs> Account number, routing number, <laughs> social security number, phone number. <laughs> we want numbers only, actually. If you just send us email filled with numbers, yes, that would we be are, good. We are turning into a cult. <laughs> that's what we're requiring from everyone. Uh, another comment. This comes from Dave and Gareth's app. Mm-hmm. Okay. Do you remember? Uh, there was, I forget what the actual question was, but uh, it was about, you know, someone's relative who's shitty. And we're just like, just don't talk to them anymore. Uh huh. Mm hmm. The person, yes, her, uh, her, her partner. Her partner had a real shitty brother. Yes. Mm hmm. And we're like, you don't have to talk to them. Yeah. Get out of here. You can get, minimize yeah, your interaction. He's trash. You've done your time. <laughs> Hi, Naomi and Andy. I just listened to episode 216. The advice about the bad in-law hit me in the truth sector. Mm. (laughs) I was struck by how all of you resoundingly, without hesitation, condemned the idea of tolerating this guy or having any relationship with him, be he an in-law or not. I've been needing to hear this for a very embarrassingly long time. Mm. Thanks for what you do and bring into this world. I enjoy so much your voices and personalities a great comfort. Well, I love that. I also love when you choose the comments that are praising us. I love it. You're like, we can't read them all, but we're going to read the nice ones. But thank you. I love, first of all, love to hit someone in a truth sector. Uh, all right. I wonder where it is on your body. Is it your trunk? I, I, is it your inner thigh? I locate it like behind your sternum. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you mean your heart? Well, just in the middle. Not middle. just not just where your heart is. Because then your heart a little bit over to the left or some shit oh, like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> some shit like that. So angry. <laughs> so resentful. But I thought apparently, because today, Sydney Sweeney is getting roasted online. Uh-huh. Her dad, she posted some pictures of her mom's birthday. And yeah. her dad's wearing like a Blue Lives Matter shirt. Yeah. And everyone's like, why are you hanging out with your dad? <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's so funny. It was also her grandma's birthday. And so it's like so funny. And it was all like hoedown themed. I just thought the whole thing was hysterical. Uh-huh. Yeah, and I just love it. I love Andrew T. Whenever someone is like being not even racist online, but just like being adjacent to racist, <laughs> racist adjacent yeah. online, Andrew T. is there with like just like saying like you don't have to talk to them, you don't have to <laughs> like you, like you don't have to hang out with your relatives that are shitty, right? And it's just like yeah, you can minimize as much as you can, as your- much as you can. I will say my one thing though about that situation is I'm like, and I don't know her life, but I feel like. You could not talk to somebody and still end up caught out in a picture with them. Yes. Like it's grandma's 90th. Don't don't bring trouble to grandma. Yeah. Okay. Ever she ain't got much time, so don't start fighting at a birthday. Just stand there and smile. Yeah. I can see that too. But also, again, hysterical <laughs> love at everyone being like, the fuck? Anyway, next comment. I think that is that should be the, the lesson of Hollywood is that you might end up in a picture with someone <laughs> shitty and you didn't mean to. I've learned that. Already. <laughs> Already. And we have an update from Steph's episode. Do you remember someone called in? They felt like they had been love bombed by a serial yes. love bomber. Yes, yes, who's yes. A shitty member of their community, mm-hmm. but just a shitty member. Right, 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 right. Not an illegal member. Exactly. The There's no like illegal action being taken. We said, this person sucks. Forget about them. Uh, we. We would like to live in a world where people can commit revenge, but we don't think that's the smart thing to do. Hi, Andy and Naomi. (laughs) Um, I am the caller from Steph's episode who uh, was love bombed by a serial love bomber. (laughs) Um, Thank you for answering my question. Uh, Y'all basically gave the advice that I ended up doing, so good advice, which was to drop the whole issue of pursuing revenge against this serial love bomber um, who is definitely a drug dealer at this point. Multiple people have now told me that he's a drug dealer. Basically what happened here is that I'm new to the area that I live in. And so a lot of people had information that I just wasn't privy to yet. And strangely dating him (laughs) exposed me to more people. And then those people are my friends now. And those people told me for the most part that people are aware that he's a womanizer um, he is not the mayor, nor is he on city council. Uh, I will not say what his business is, just in case someone else in my city listens to this podcast, just because it's pretty specific. But uh, the thing that pisses me off about him the most is that he's, where he's popular is the subset of liberal kind of 30s, 40s, millennial group of people in what is a pretty red state and red city. So he's like, seen as this big ally and then he's not 
uh, he treats women terribly, but it's a tale as old as time. Anyway, I thought about just like glitter bombing him. Like I was going to do stuff, have friends do stuff to him for a week, just so he'd have like a really bad week in a low key way. But I've dropped that too. And you know, he's trying to pursue me again, actually, but I'm just living my life, setting the boundaries and Thanks for answering my question. Thanks for your podcast. Love you. Bye. Okay. Popular with this liberal crowd. Is it Beto O'Rourke? Do you think that's who it is? <laughs> also just obsessed with whatever his businesses are. She won't mention them, but I just, there's nothing I want to know more than what. Can you just please like write us privately? We won't just tell me what his businesses are. I'm obsessed. It is fucked up. Yeah. What is he like a mandolin repairman or something? Like it is insane <laughs> That, like, if you're a shitty person in a certain, like, subculture, mm -hmm. like, you own that subculture. Yes. Right? Whether it's yep. indie rock. I remember, like, when I first got into indie rock and I was like, oh, finally, it's going to be like a bunch. Like, we all like the same music. So everyone here is going to be progressive, <laughs> and anti-racist, and feminist, and all that stuff. And it's like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> nope. There's only a small amount of people that are. And there's a lot of creeps. Yep. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that's where a lot of predators thrive in those subcultures where they can kind of be top dog, where they can, you know, build up this reputation, honey. That they should do be the this. next predator movie. Should be uh, a comedy club booker. Amber Midthunder, is that her name? Yeah. Going after, like, yeah, yeah. like comedy bookers <laughs> and like indie rock stars. <laughs> oh, God, like gamer guys who are like big uh, yeah. in that big world. Big Twitch streamers. Big Twitch streamers. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, okay, Naomi, we have to get to today's episode. We have to. Who is our guest? Oh, our old friend. A dear friend, Henny. Just like darkness, he's an old friend. Okay, <laughs> the one, the only Matt Rogers. Come on now, you know Matt yes. from his podcast, Lost Culturistas. Of course, you can watch Matt in the movie Fire Island on Hulu on this Showtime show. I love that for you. Matt is out here bringing you a game I love serving. That for us. I love that for us, and you know what? I love that for you, the listener, because this is about to pop off. Roll it. Do you ever think back in the days of? <laughs> Sitting in the hallway at UCB. <laughs> Honestly, you couldn't really sit in that hallway because it was always wet. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the that's, that's the I issue about it. that hallway back there. I mean, there was like an area where you could go, kind of hang out, and then there was an area back behind the stage that was always like soaking wet. Like it was always like. <laughs> But also those spaces, like those old comedy spaces we used to perform in all the time, like that, I guess, was their charm, right? That there were exposed nails everywhere. There were health hazards. Um, yeah. Part of the danger of the whole thing. It's like, you if, know what I'm if saying? If you did not walk away with wet jeans and tetanus, you were not doing comedy right. No, 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 no. And also reeking of whatever smell that was. Um <laughs> And only it's like it's like certain certain people that like performed in those comedy spaces know the smells I'm talking about. But like really what it can be boiled down to is like if you've ever been to like a basement theater and mm -hmm. think, oh, there's that smell that these basement theaters all have. I'll tell you what it is. Decomposing rat. Ew. That's just the truth. It's just the truth. Oh, God. You're probably very right. Well, I'll never forget when it was confirmed for me. I was at the pit underground, um, uh, R. which was the, the, literally R.I.P. Um, P.I.T. <laughs> underground. <laughs> exactly. Um, but it was like, I was like, what is that smell? Like, And honestly, it was like, it wasn't even like a nasty smell. It was just a distinct smell. Yeah. And I asked like one of the interns there, and they were like, oh, that's rat. <laughs> Dead now, in my mind, by the way, uh, you are in overalls holding a sledgehammer, <laughs> yeah. smashing through the wall to verify this. But no, answers. it's just you're just taking someone at their word. Well, I would know. Certainly, I'd never pick up a hammer in my life. Um, and this is I, this is I think my third appearance on this podcast, and you don't get that by now. I don't do any labor. Um, well, no. Andy's open. You know, Andy says he he says I'm not going to put anyone in a box. Maybe Matt does take a hammer to things. You know, whereas I would have said Matt ain't touching no hammer. No, I'm not you touching know. no hammer. But the thing is, um, I, it's it, it goes beyond that for me. Like I have license plates that I was supposed to put on my car, but that would require getting even a screwdriver. <laughs> And so I'm not doing that. Like, I'll, I'll just, when it becomes a real problem, i.e. like the car is impounded or I'm in jail, then I'll deal with it. <laughs> but until then, I'm not touching that screwdriver. Now, does that also apply to 
cleaning like chores and stuff in your own home or everything actually i just want to know like are you just like i'll deal with the repercussions Later. when they come <laughs> With cleaning, um, I try to keep it pretty tidy in here, but you can also tell when I'm not doing so great or when I have too much free time, like shit starts to pile up. Like actually, right after I um, get off with you guys, I'm going to, it's not it's not dirty or filthy. It's mm -hmm, always mm -hmm. messy with me. It's always just like, oh, I didn't hang that shirt up, you yes. know, that type of thing. But I, I don't allow things to get like, dirty yes, or like yes, lack yes. of cleanliness mm -hmm. is not okay if for me it's it's just clutter yes it's, yes it's yes, clutter yes. i am that same way andy had to i think i've done pretty good andy's like could you not put your clothes on the back of the dining room chairs yeah <laughs> he's well, like that, you not and i was like oh yeah actually you've gone like yeah. there was a point where it was getting really bad <laughs> and i was getting really angry yeah um <laughs> And then um, I don't know what changed, but well, I heard you, and I said <laughs> yeah. it's not worth fighting over. Open communication. We exactly. got there. It is different when you are dating someone, though, right? I mean, like it's like that. Whenever I've dated someone and they really allowed me to come over and see all their mess and stuff, I was like, oh, this is this is how I know it's gone too far down this road. It's like oh, I, I see. I'm the kind of person where it's just like. If I can pull it off at one point when I do get into another relationship, like, and it gets serious, like, it's gonna be separate bathrooms. Like, mm. I, I don't want to see, I don't want to see the person that I'm having sex with devolve in that way. Like, I can't, <laughs> I can't be going to a shared toilet bowl and see what you're working with in that regard like i can't like i it actually like i shut down in a major way wow uh, okay. and maybe that's just me being immature but like i don't like to share space that can get dirty in that way and i you know was was in the pandemic with a boyfriend for a certain amount of time and it just got to the point where it was just like oh i know that the world is going to hell with the pandemic but we can't be living in this much <laughs> clothing on the ground and i'm not saying i'm perfect but like when you're in a relationship you have to like i don't know there, there has to be some sort of like you know you decadence. want a little illusion a little maintain, yeah, a little illusion I, maintain I actually think a little yeah. i think an illusion is good i think an illusion yeah. it shows that you care yeah. So piss, yeah, yeah, yeah. piss stains are your hard existential boundary. <laughs> I don't like, yeah, piss stains, but like sometimes I had another ex boyfriend who will remain nameless who often, like, okay, so there's flushing the toilet, which is like really flushing it, like holding mm -hmm. it down and making sure everything goes down. And then there's flushing the toilet, like, oh yeah, I pushed the button down and then I left the thing. It's like, <laughs> no, you have to make sure when right. you flush the toilet that everything goes down there uh -huh. because. If you don't, you're going to have to, say it with me, courtesy flush. <laughs> and a lot of people out here are not giving the courtesy flush. Sorry, stop. Hold on, everyone. Everyone shut the fuck well, the up. Fact that you, the fact that you even Hold need on. me to stop right now shows me what kind of person you are. The, it the is latter. fucking insane to me. It is fucking insane. Sorry, hold on. People are not like no no no. This one's like you would never oh, know it was in the bathroom. Oh no no oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. oh okay no good. no no. People are not ashamed. Like I'm ashamed <laughs> that I have a body at all. I'm ashamed that anything comes out of my body. You're right in, yeah. from any part of it. Yeah yeah. And yeah. the fact that other people are just like proud or indifferent to indifferent. It's like they don't they don't they're like what every you know they're very like everybody poops and it's like they're not yeah, thinking about we it. Don't speak of it. Yeah. No, they're not thinking about it. And my thing is just like, I, to me, it's just like, I'll only say it one or two times, too. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, I, and then it's humiliating to come out of the bathroom and like be around someone that ostensibly you're supposed to have sex with and just be <laughs> like, hey, um, I noticed some of your waste still in the <laughs> toilet. Uh, if we could m minimize that, that would be ideal for me and for you, I think, because I ain't engaging unless um, this is this is lickety split. Exactly. Sorry, help me, help me, everyone. What, Andy? Sorry, I'm for the listener. I'm smushing my fingers He's into smushing. my eyes. He can't take He's it. Hoping to gouge them out so I never have to see this image in my head again. But what is the psychology behind someone who's just like, eh? They it's not it's not an active eh. it's exactly. not it, it's exactly. it's just it's just a but i flushed the toilet you know what i mean and then they're not they're not going back to the toilet to check you know what i mean they flush the toilet they leave the bathroom that's it they wash their hands hopefully hopefully um, i'm gonna say hopefully honey because with that little half dab of the of the lever that ain't nothing that half dab you know 
That's what I'm saying. It's a half dab of the lever instead of a prolonged one, two, even three. And Honey, now, like, now I you know. hear the pipe, okay? You hear the plumbing. You know when it's gone down. Yeah. And that's like a real... I think that happens a lot. Or at least I noticed in people who, when they were growing up, had their own bathroom. Mm-hmm. You know, like there was a, a people where it's like, oh, when they grew up, they had like a bathroom in their bedroom. And it's like the kids had their bathroom, you know? Right. So like, I think they're a little more predisposed to just do that because it it didn't have the same like, let's check on what you're doing, yeah. you know? But like yeah, my mom be. would yell at me if she came in that bathroom and saw anything because it was like our shared yeah. bathroom and it was not going to happen. I also know that we're in the place now where it's a little bit more normal to just piss in a toilet and then leave it there because of water and everything. And like, but I don't do well with that either. Like, I don't, I don't like it when I go to the be- re- be- restroom and like, it's like a dark yellow. Like, I'm just like, I don't know. Like, it just doesn't sit right with me. And then I, I just, I just don't like it. And it does stay in the bowl. But yes. I also know we need to be be more cognizant. But I don't know. I'll reduce my emissions in other ways. I, I'm flushing my toilet after I use the bathroom every time. I mean, every maybe time. if I, I'm immovable there. I think. Uh-huh, uh-huh. How about this? One less flight on your private jet on the <laughs> one right. less flight on the Las Culturistas private jet yeah. a week, and no. you can flush the toilet every time. What it's gonna be is I'm gonna take as many rides on the private jet. I'm just gonna <laughs> stop loading it out to my friends. That that <laughs> there it is. There you go. There it is. You can take that's a three really, minute flight. That's the yes. Taylor Swift drama of it all. It's that like it, it's people are like. She flies every single day on her private jet. It's like, no, she doesn't. But what she's not thinking about is it belongs to her and she allows other people to use it like for the majority of the year. So it's it's like the carbon emissions are ascribed to her since right. she owns the jet, but she's not actually using it every day, which doesn't matter. But, you but know. also like also when she says other people use it like. That's for money. Like, that's an income stream. Taylor's basically like, I'm going to buy a jet. No, she's just lending it to people, apparently. She just lended it. I refuse to believe Taylor it did not say, you better pay me for my jet. I think that she does lend it. I actually what? know so- I know someone who it's been offered to. <gasps> oh, I my God. Never, I can never say who. Well, Matt, this also, this is a perfect pivot into your ascension. <laughs> <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, obviously, you know, because we talk about relationships and stuff here. And I'm curious as to, as you become more um, well-known, more front-facing, are you having more people, are you able to spot the fakers? Are you able to spot the people who are just trying to be close? Because I think that you are still, you always have been, but I think you still are. You're a very warm person, a friendly person. You know, like you don't seem to have the walls up that someone might have who, you know. Yeah, I think that my thing is... um, if I can spot them, I'm shocked at how much sometimes it doesn't matter to me. <laughs> um, that's what I'll say. Like, if I, if someone comes up and they're like a quote-unquote, like, you know, not that I think of myself this way, but if they're a quote-unquote, like, star fucker, or if there's someone who's, like, you know, aware of me and, like, you know, interested in that regard, it's like, well... If I'm into it and they're into it, then I'm usually like, whatever, like, let's, let's, it is what it is. But then sometimes I do think like, eh, you know, I don't really know if I'm looking for the randomness of it all anymore. Like, I think I'm not really in that space. Right now, I'm sort of in an in-between place of like, wanting to hook up for sure. But my new thing is like, if I'm going to meet up with someone to just hook up with them, I do want to get a drink first. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Like, just because... I think that there's too much like weird gray area now between what people th- think and expect. And um, yeah, maybe it is that like I-, I have been out there a little bit more and I can spot it a little bit more. But it's just like I would like to get to know someone before I engage with them in that way just because I feel better about it and I think they feel better about it. Like I, I would hate for someone to you know, like approach and say like, hey, I really like what you do and I'm a fan and then may- then maybe say something flirty and then me take it the wrong way. There's just too many op- too many opportunities to take things the wrong way, I think, that mm. it's just like, let's be really clear about what this is. Like, I'm not necessarily looking for anything either way. I'm looking to be surprised and delighted um, <laughs> and that I can usually figure out if that's going to happen like over drinks. But maybe, I don't know, maybe it's just me being more more in my 30s now. But like, <laughs> I just I feel like I did the thing of like being on Grindr and being super random and like having my stories about like um, 
what happened when I did this. And now yeah. I'm just kind of like, if I can be in control of it, I would like to be in control of it. Wait, what do you mean by super random? I mean, like random sex off grinder. I mean, like, like come over now. I don't know anything about you. Yeah, right. right exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. and oh, okay. I, I, I've, I've done that a ton. You know what I mean? Like, not a ton. I've probably, I've probably hooked up on grinder like over, let's say over twenty times, which is like you know inviting someone over who you don't know, right? With with an aim to continue to not know them. Right. Uh -huh. Um. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, and nowadays it's just like. I've had, I've never had like a terrible experience. Like I have a friend who like one time invited someone over and then the guy ended up chasing him around his apartment with a knife. <gasps> like for uh, real, like I mean, there's horror stories. Well, that's what I'm, you know, cause I watch true crime. So I'm convinced I'm like, they're yeah. all murderers. How do you do it? Like, I'd be much more like, Hey, meet me in this coffee shop. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be, I'd be more like, more be like, we can have sex in a coffee shop bathroom than I would let you come to my house. <laughs> my, yeah. No, but honestly, like, it, and, and people really do fake shit i mean yeah. like they people are really good at pretending to seem normal uh-huh um and then sometimes it doesn't even matter if they're normal or not because you might just be that horny and you oh. might not be you See. might not be like thinking about um it from that angle like if they're a little right. weird maybe you're into that that night you know what i'm saying and <laughs> uh -huh. so like it's like ah whatever he's a little weird whatever and then you invite him over and he's chasing you around your apartment naked with a knife. You know what I mean? Like it, it can go there. So for uh -huh. me, I'm just like, I've had so many experiences that haven't been bad, but have been a little weird. Like didn't expect that person to be a certain energy or you just meet up with someone that you talked to and it was horny on the app, but then you meet them in real life and the chemistry is not there. I mean, I don't yeah. know. I, I, I like to take more responsibility with these things now. Yes. yes, yes, yeah, you want to know what you're getting into, because I think that to me, I mean, of course, you know, naturally I say repeatedly I'm sex negative, so, you know, it's not the same, <laughs> it's not the same, but that feeling of like, how enjoyable can it be mm. with a total stranger, kind of as you get older and start to have preferences and interests, like, I think when you're 21, 22, like 25, you're like, I just want to hook up, like, this is going to feel nice, yeah. whereas I think as you get older and start to be like, you're not well, doing it right. You don't know what's up. I think I the know. answer to that question that is the reason why you have to decide to stop doing it is because sometimes it can be pretty fucking good. <laughs> I mean, actually, I think some of the best sex I've ever had has been with complete like a rando. randos. Like, I remember... All right, this is taking it back, but <laughs> I I wasn't super sexually experienced um, when I was like even 25, 26, 27. And I was dating my first boyfriend and we were sort of having problems in that area. And I think something that we tried was to be open. And uh, that meant that for the very first time, I downloaded Grindr. And um, I had never used the app before. And I used it, and <laughs> I had the most insane sex I'd ever had with someone who, up to that point, was not some was not someone I would ever. Because I, you know, it's like when you're when you're like growing up and you realize that you're gay, like in like a very like homogenized zone, and like you see certain film and television, and it's like this is the dream boy. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's like this like. I used to think my type was like, you know, he's like a musician and, you know, like, like, you know, my, my, my type is like, um, you know, he's a preppy boy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and he's good to his mother. And then you, you, you like go on Grindr and someone talks to you like, here's what I want to do to you. And you're like, oh, okay. And then you engage with that person and you're like, oh no, that was so <laughs> fucking incredible. Like I liked the danger in that and that's when you start to like realize like oh i don't even know myself sexually at all but because mm -hmm. i grew up in a in a environment where like i couldn't have like a messy first boyfriend in high school you know what i mean like i yeah. could i wasn't exposed to a lot of like you know difference of you know sexual identity of diversity etc like you don't know what you're into what you like whatever and then you get to, you know, be in your mid twenties, and you have the app grinder in your hand, <laughs> and it's like this, like you know, menu right. of like possibility, right. and A you whole dive new in. World. It's it is giving men you. If only Alan Menken could write a song about Grinder. If only we could bring him <laughs> back from the dead to like have him inspired in that way. Um, but like, 
Uh, oh wait, Alan Menken, is he dead? No, I think he's alive. Who's the one that's dead? Howard Ashman. <laughs> Mankin, anyway, Mankin, get on it then. If you're alive, yeah, get on it. Get, get on, on it. Alive and listening to this. But what I'm saying is just song. like it's like it's like actually what keeps you on the app is that you never know if it's gonna be good. And you know what I mean? Ooh. It's like it's like throw it's like throwing uh, it's like fish in a barrel. You might yeah, catch yeah, a big yeah. one, a big juicy <laughs> one. It's why I don't gamble. It it is a real gambling. <laughs> it's a real gambling because you could end up with. Uh, American Psycho. You're like, I just want my ass eaten and <laughs> you end yeah. up with Patrick Bateman or whatever his name is. Right. But the thing too about like just wanting your ass eaten is it's like sometimes like, like for example, like, I don't know, especially during desperate times, like during the pandemic when it's like, oh, oh I've always had a thing with this person, but do I really want to engage with them in that way? And once I go down this road, like they're a friend, I'm making them something that's not a friend. It's like, is that going to be weird? Like, so again, like, like, yes, like, everyone's, like, a base sexual person, and, like, uh, unless you're sex negative and you declare it repeatedly on podcasts. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> but, like, but like I don't know. It's just interesting, like, when you're all cooped up, like, what decisions you make or when you feel like you really are desperate for something. That's why mm-hmm. I just, if I'm going to make those decisions now, I do it with those close to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I ruin things I know I can rebuild because I, the person and I started off in a, at a base, po- uh, you know, point. You know what I <laughs> right, mean? Right, right. Stranger, I, I know my close friends that I could fuck up relationships aren't, aren't with aren't going to kill me. You know right. what I mean? I don't, right. I don't know these grinder people aren't going to kill me. Right. Right. right, exactly. Well, that answers my question from earlier about repercussions. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And not worrying about them so much. But he does. No, yeah, I mean. Yeah. I well, no, you're like, well, I can rebuild this. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, look, I've been messy with my friends. I'm, I'm like any like modern gay man, I guess. Like, I have a group of gay friends, and like things get a little messy sometimes in that regard. Like, I, I and especially especially during the pandemic like you know it, it it's like it's a thing like when you're in your pod with a certain people and you're like well i know i at least like these people mm-hmm. you know what i mean like and certain things happen but um i guess my thing is yeah I- i'm not trying to randomize that part of my life in the way that i used to mm-hmm. and that's not to say like i i meet someone that night and don't go home with them that happens all the time i just have drinks first or get right. to know them first <laughs> or at least know what one of my friends thinks about them first. Like, yes. you know what I mean? Like, I ask questions. Mm-hmm. I do my due diligence. <laughs> and then I act like a hoe. <laughs> I mean, you're, do- you're just joking, though, about, like, you know, oh, I can take these risks with my friends. But I was thinking, you are friends with a lot of your exes. Like, you're mm-hmm. able to kind of go back to a friendship relationship. And is yeah. that was that always something you were good at? I think it's more I just refuse to let people go and need things on my own terms. But um, what I like about, um, I guess, both my exes is they both those relationships were based in friendship. And so by the time I realized with both of them that they weren't going in the direction that I think they needed to go or we wanted different things or I thought we'd be healthier apart, it felt silly to me to throw away the entire relationship period point blank just because we dated and it takes a long time and you know some people are not as amenable to continuing a relationship as others but for me it's just like if i've opened my life up to you and i'm close to you it means something and if i can maintain that i like to Mm -hmm. um but i also totally understand and respect people who are like scorched earth about the whole thing who can't see um who can't see the person that they dated. You know what I mean? Like, I yeah. get it. It's just not who I am. Like, I don't know. But wait, your friends, but I mean, do you literally hang out with them? Or are you just like, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, they hang. Well, well, Henry and I don't see each other as much anymore. Um, this is my first boyfriend. Um, that was your but, first boyfriend? Wait, Henry? Henry was my first boyfriend, yeah. Henry. Oh, wow, Capuzzi. I had no idea. That yeah, Henry? Yeah, yeah. Yes, that Henry. Yes, yes. I'm piano, miming piano playing player. a piano. <laughs> I'm miming. And I just wanted to make sure we were on the same page. Yeah, I'm he's, just like, wait, he's what? Still, he's still my musical director for my shows. We talk mm-hmm. a lot, like... Um, I'm working with him this month, and I'm, I'm we're going on tour together. We go on tour together every year. Like we we're doing 14 cities um, this December, so we're going to be together a whole lot. And <laughs> we still speak a lot of the same languages, especially like comedically, artistically, musically. So it's great. I mean, we have this thing that um, I was actually really emotional when we broke up because I felt like. Um, or after we broke up, looking back on the relationship, because I feel like ev- everything in a relationship, like everything you try, like every emotion that you have um, is just all pointed in the direction of how do I figure out with this other person how to make each other better? 
You know what I mean? Like this relationship, like, like, of course there's great moments. There's not so great moments, but ultimately how do, how are we making each other better, a better version of the other one? Um, and in our work together, we, we really are able to do that. And I mm-hmm. think that that was something out of that relationship that I like truly, truly love. And, um, so with he and I, and also we were just young and, uh, yeah. with he and I, it's that. And with Jared, my, my second boyfriend, it's like, um, he and I are just such close friends and we just care about each other so much and have such a similar sense of humor and, um, interests that, um, we really are able to intuit each other emotionally in a way. And then, you know, like, it's just so when you get to be that vulnerable with someone, it's just, it's just hard. And it feels like, why are we going to throw this away just because we want different things in life? Like, and mm-hmm. and, it, and it, it's hard. I mean, like, and, and, you know, there's slip ups, you know, I've certainly been the type of person to hook up with an ex. Like, I mean, I've done it. Like, yeah. I think that it's actually like, you know, it, it's, it's a thing. And, uh, I just try to judge myself a little bit less because it's hard, you know, emotional yeah. shit is tough. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, but I think that is why people will scorch the earth because mm-hmm. it is like because it is like when you're like, okay, we are physically attracted to each other, then we do have this emotional foundation that you don't have with a lot of people just because exactly. of the time you spent. And so you're like, well, how do I just not continue to try to be in your bed? Do you know, know. Again, I think people who are like, so then they don't yeah. know. I mean, you were I like know. this too because like you would break up with somebody and get back together and, and break up and get back and try to be friends. up yeah. <laughs> years after that to the point where like it was just like, uh, I don't know if I'm ever going to, I had to like stop it because I'm like, I don't know if I'm ever going to get over you if we don't stop hooking up. Right. Like, and, and that's, yeah, yeah, that's when the boundaries come in. And um, I think that's something that, especially from my perspective, like a lot of people, a lot of gay men my age are just really not good at boundaries. Um, and it's because I don't think there's been a lot of examples of boundaries um, put in front of us. Like my generation of gay men, like we didn't really have a lot of gay couples that were older than us to look up to to be like, oh, that's an example of a healthy monogamous relationship. That's an mm-hmm. example of a healthy open relationship. That's an example of a healthy single person. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Um, this is an example of a healthy group of gay friends who have history. You know what I mean? Like it's just now I feel like almost like not a responsibility, but an opportunity to, as someone who's like a creator and a comedian and an actor, like try to be a part of like showing what these things look like. I mean, like being in the movie fire Island, like I honestly think that's one of the only times I've seen an honest real seeming group of gay friends in a movie that was like accessible to everyone. Um, Mm -hmm. that wasn't like explaining away their existence or dumbing them, dumbing it down or making it seem like something that it wasn't. Um, so I think that honestly in, in representation, we can have like a healthier, um, new generation come up and maybe it'll be a little bit less messy or just less. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, le- less feeling like you have to apologize for everything because none of us know what the fuck we're doing. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Were there any examples when you were growing up of like, this is a gay I relationship mean, that, that like I want to pattern myself after or like this feels right to me. Like either in your, romantically. In your, no, no, not romantically, yeah. not sexually. No, there, because it was, I'll tell you what it was. And this is just the real truth. It was like, when I was younger, there was like Will and Grace, right? And it was like Will and Jack had a good friendship and they had a good platonic friendship between gay men. But all of Will's boyfriends like were played by straight actors and he was a straight actor, straight Eric actor. McCormick. And it just felt like what was being said was this is a gay relationship that we're not laughing at. Because anything Jack was ever involved in was like probably with also another femme person, and we were more laughing at it. Whereas like all of the Will relationships were like, when he comes to the door, we shake hands and kiss on the cheek. It was sexless. Like, it was all yeah. sexless. Yeah, it was fully. all sexless. And I have to say, like the reason why we men are dating other men is to be fucking them. So <laughs> like, let's not pretend this is a sexless thing. It's not. It's actually 
quite explicitly about sex. Yeah. So, and I guess that was hard to, to, to walk the line with, like, in a mainstream, like, you know, network television show at the time. But that is what we had. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, Will never ate anyone's ass? <laughs> no, I don't even think... Uh, I, I think that that would have been, like... <laughs> Like a, like a different genre. It would if, yeah. if if they had even said the word ass, it would have been like what? But I remember then there was like queer as folk. You know what I mean? Which yes, got and her, they which were having sex. They certainly were, but like that was more like by the time as a young gay person you found queer as folk, you couldn't like pay attention to the storyline because essentially <laughs> you were just watching like soft core. It uh-huh, was like so uh-huh. jarring to see sex like that on television that you couldn't focus on like what the characters were quote unquote going through right like right. all you could see was like an actual depiction of someone eating ass and you were like <laughs> like what what do i what do i do with this like right. you know what I mean? your the eyes is, out of your keep head. watching yeah <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> what? Well, yeah but i mean yeah I, I cut everyone a lot of slack for being like for having like a second adolescence like yeah because yeah, we yeah, didn't yeah. have a first one well, it's, I mean, but like in other, sorry, I just have to, like, there was no, like, I'm just trying to figure out, cause like, I, these are all the kinds of, um, uh, uh, culture, cultural touch points that I also had in the yeah. like, 90s. I mean, were 2000s. there a lot of interracial relationships you saw on television? Like, no. probably one or no. two, like, Boy Meets World. Well, that hello, was we say Sean more. and Angela all the time. And yeah, I, I mean, Sean and Angela, but like, then, then the monsters. What? Did you say the monsters? Yeah, yeah. He was a Frankenstein. Girl, she was bye. A, she was a Dracula. Exactly. Girl, Frankenstein, that's not a race. <laughs> but well, no, but it's well, so true. Well, well, but no, well. but it's also like, especially because because I've, I've been rewatching Will and Grace in particular. And like when we talk about like not only was it sex list, but yes, you were like NBC Thursday nights. But there was no shortage of Deborah Messon's ass in, you know, um, lingerie in bed with a guy. I was like, you never saw Will and her and a boyfriend in bed together. The way they would show her and a guy, like, and I don't mean having sex, but literally just like waking up and rolling over and having a kiss or doing whatever. And they never did that. Did Fraser fuck? Yes. Yeah, he did. One time, Will and Jack woke up in bed together. Yes, yes, yes. And yes. it was like it was like a joke. And I don't even think they had sex. I think that it came. No, out no, no. They like fell they just asleep. Passed out. They fell asleep. They were on Karen's yacht. And but when I tell you that was a that was the end of the episode. The big yeah. break of the episode was did something happen? Did they have sex? And then like the next episode, of course, the next one was like, well, absolutely not. No, no, they did no, not. they never could. No, they, they should don't even have buttholes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And it was like, or like the moments when, but then it was also funny because again, that was a popular show, right? So I very mm. much remember when Patrick Dempsey plays Will's boyfriend for like two episodes and his whole yeah. thing is that he's not out and he's yeah. like introduces Will as his brother. But I just remember being like, is this Patrick Dempsey trying to like change his image? You know what I mean? He's like, look, I could play gay, which means sitting with a man. Like, because they don't, they do not kiss. They like a hug. When he comes to no. the door, he gives him a hug. And you're and just then, like, yeah, like <gasps> his 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 boyfriend that like went the distance was played by Bobby Cannavale. Yep. And his whole thing was that he was Vince who was a fu- who was a firefighter, right? <laughs> a cop. He was a cop. He was a cop. Yeah, I mean like how do you get more <laughs> like know. not gay than <laughs> Bobby Cannavale playing a guy named Vince who's a cop who talks like Bobby Cannavale. You know what I mean? And I was just like and so, and at the time, though, it felt like, oh, but we do have representation. And so that's what I mean when I say I get to my mid-20s and I'm confused about myself sexually. It's because we've only ever seen acceptable depictions of gay relationships that aren't actually real. Right. Right. And also white, 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 white. That's another thing. It's like Nobody. White, 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 white. To the Ooh. point where, like, of course there's fetish, fetish, fetish. Shization <laughs> in the gay community because like like again like there's there was no diversity growing up there was no representation in terms of like a diverse relationship like gay people are already so in their heads about so many different things and then like all of a sudden you give them an app where they're allowed to say whatever the fuck they want and yet of course some of these dark people like the, that are like so disgusting on the inside like and haven't dealt with their their other issues like will say this disgusting stuff. Right. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's, so it's a lot. I mean, the, yeah. gay, the gay community has a long way to go, but for me personally, I'm taking it to drinks. 
<laughs> I guess the thing that I was I was curious about though is like, did you ever seek out other media outside of like because the mainstream media was so desperately homophobic, right? right? Were there other places where you could search out and be like, oh, well, this is. In this movie that I found on whatever criteria. This German film. This German film actually <laughs> depicts like a real gay couple. And I'll I can be kind honest of like. You, no, no. Because like I, that wasn't even in my head. All I wanted. Well, you know what I really what I really lacked was people with my sense of humor talking like me. That's what I wanted. Mm. I didn't really care about like looking to the future or like looking looking to the media and being like, but what's my husband going to be like? I didn't yeah. think about it because I just figured I'll never have one. What I wanted was friends I could be honest with. Like what I wanted was, you know, uh, to know what my sense of humor was and how to be able to use it. So honestly, what I would watch when my parents weren't in the house, I would go on HBO on demand and I would watch sex in the city. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Because I was told it's like, here's women talking with each other the way you've never heard before. And I was like, all right, well I'm interested in that. And then the jokes they'd make to each other and the way they'd talk about men and the way they'd have different perspectives on things. I was like, I can, I can feel myself being a part of this conversation. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I was interested in it. They were very aspirational. They lived in New York City. Um, and also, Great not for nothing, th not for nothing, but when they would have sex, it would look like sex. Yeah. At least what yeah, I yeah, thought yeah. of sex looking like at the time. You know what I mean? And yeah, then yeah, yeah. They, they would have sex on the show for real. They would show it. And then afterwards, they would talk about what it was like. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. like, like, for example, in the episode where the guy that Miranda's sleeping with wants her to eat his ass. Mm -hmm. And I had never heard of that before, rimming. I didn't know what that was. And then they had a discussion about it at brunch right afterwards. And I'm, I'll never, like... I'll never forget that because it was just like, wow, they really are having a discussion about this thing that I'm like uncomfortable with, <laughs> but, but I'm seeing is a thing, right? you know, right, like, right, right. so that was like formative for me in a way. Cause weren't you, I was trying to think cause you're a little bit younger than me. So you would have been early high school, late middle school. Well, the Sex and the City show started in like the late nineties. Yeah, and it was like ended. I believe it ended in two thousand four. So that was when I was. If if it's six seasons, then it's the years when I was eight to fourteen. Oh wow! Okay, <laughs> so very little. And then what? So the after. movie came. The movie came out when I was in college. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. uh -huh, uh -huh. So yeah. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you watched. I was it, born in nineteen ninety. Oh my god, <laughs> Andrew! We gotta stop the episode. We gotta stop the episode. Hey, you that reaction—that reaction every time, like we didn't all know we were different ages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I no, but you know what it is for me, especially though, because I saw you perform around the same time. So for me, people I saw perform around the same time were all. Oh yeah, the yeah, same yeah. Age. we're all. Well, I I feel like that same, way too. You know what I mean? Think. I also think I, I also started very young. Right, I was 19 you when NYU. I started comedy because I was at NYU and I was sort of accelerated in that area. So probably we met when I was like 25. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah but in my head, I was like, so we're all we're all 37 doing our best. And you know what I mean? Because like, we're all like start comedy. I'm, I'm like, actually oh. legally not allowed to ask you about eating ass. Right. Because, <laughs> of, the age because of the age gap. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. OK, well, Andy, I think we've unpacked a lot and I think now people need Matt's help. All right, we'll be hey, okay. right back. I'm, I'm, I'm here to help. <laughs> After this. For the past 20 years, Google has been protecting Americans from cybersecurity threats. From anti-phishing measures to safe browsing tools, Google is building advanced technologies that raise the bar for the entire industry and makes the whole Internet safer. Learn more at safety.google. Hey y'all, Andy here with a rare ad read. Yes, it's me doing the ad read and you want to know why? Because today we are sponsored by Con Air. No, not the fairly enjoyable, if I remember correctly, it's been a while, movie starring Nicolas Cage and John Cusack. I'm talking about the hair dryer company and I was excited about this because we're already a Con Air family. I've been using their hair dryers forever. All right, so let's talk about the Infinity Pro. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen my haircut, but it's basically been the same since I was a child. 
Yes, if you knew me in grade school, grad school, or running around doing 1,000 improv shows a night in New York, not much has changed except my hairline. I've got a difficult tangle up there. It's, it's wavy, I've got a widow's peak and a cowlick, and yet, and yet, thanks to the Con Air Infinity Pro, my hair comes out feeling smooth and healthy looking with reduced frizz. Yeah, that's right, nobody's calling me Miss Frizzle in these streets. And look, Naomi's made no secret of it in her stand-up, or on this show, or talking to our friends, or probably talking to her therapist, but I take a long time to get ready in the morning. And also, I gotta tell you, it's hot as heck here in Los Angeles, so the fact that the Infinity Pro dries my hair fast as heck, and quick as a whistle, is a godsend. And honestly, Naomi uses it to dry Mabel's hair after a bath too, and you know Mabel's not gonna sit around for too long. The Infinity Pro is lightweight, it's got three heat settings, and one of them cool buttons, which I use copiously when it's above 90 degrees, even though I know you're just supposed to use it to set your look. I gotta tell you, it's a great product. So treat yourself and your hair by searching Conair Smooth Wrap on Amazon.com or wherever you get your hair care products from online to try the new drying experience with Smooth Wrap today. Yes, folks, that's the Infinity Pro by Conair Smooth Wrap Hair Dryer. Get one today. And we're, we're back. back, honey, with Matt Rogers here to help you handle your scandal, honey. Matt comes to <laughs> us with an open heart, okay? I really Matt do. Matt comes to us as a leader in culture, in communication, and he's going to help us help you. Well, speaking of communication, let's start off with this one. This is, a, I thought, a, a softball question that we could do. At Just the, to get us going. Yeah. Okay. Top okay. Of this. Here we go. Okay. Hey, I mean, Andy, it's William. Um, I'm calling because I have a question about uh, a new relationship that I've started, and I wanted to understand or at least get your advice on um, some tips or uh, how to handle um, someone who maybe isn't the best communicator. Um, so he is a doctor, and he has a lot of work and things like that, and I work it from home, so I have a lot more time, and I don't necessarily know what's too much of an expectation going into it and what I can ask and what I can't and kind of how to navigate that. So I'd love to hear, you know, how you've done that and then maybe if you have any tips on how to do it moving forward of someone who's very needy like myself <laughs> and uh, <laughs> wants constant attention but also understands that that's not realistic. Um, so uh, I look forward to hopefully hearing from you and um, I hope you have a great day. I love you both. Bye. Wait, William, what'd you, say? What'd you ask me? Communication. So I, communi- I, but I think that that in in you saying that actually is his answer. I think he needs to ask this question to his boyfriend. I think he needs to be like honest about this and just be like, "Hey, I noticed that we have different lifestyles. You're busy a lot. I'm kind of sitting around here, and I think that that it just because I work from home, I have a lot more time for this to occupy my space. So I do want to spend more time with you and like wonder when that will happen. But I feel a little self conscious asking that because mm. I really do like you and don't want to. You know, I think he just needs to literally ask the question he asked us to him. Like he, mm-hmm. this is something. It's just so much more simple. Like if the answer is how do you communicate better? Honestly, what Better. you are, what what you actually what is your actual issue? Ask him that. Period. I'll say this too. I yeah. think Naomi, you hit on something as well. I think that was great, Matt. Um, where you're like, oh, what is the question? I think the caller is maybe not uh, used to articulating himself, or maybe his needs. His needs. Maybe He's doesn't. nervous to talk to him. That's yes. what it is. He's nervous. He, he actually knows what he wants to ask, but he's nervous to do it. Yes. And you you can't be, because I, I honestly think like, if this is going to be something that moves forward, you have to be able to express yep. yourself and not worry about the type of response that you're going to get. Once you ex- express yourself and you get a certain type of response, if that's one that doesn't sit right with you, then I think call into this podcast. Right, 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 <laughs> right, 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 right. I am someone who is who gets nervous communicating with people. So I run through the stuff in my head Mm. a Mm -hmm. lot Mm -hmm. to figure out how I want to. And obviously like reality is not when you start having conversations with actual human beings, they're not going to follow whatever the script is in your head. But so you have to, you know what? Take an improv class. Okay. (laughs) That's what you got to do. Gross. Do do one-on-one. Gross. How dare you say that to someone? I'm just, I'm just kidding. (laughs) I also wonder. I wonder if there's a little bit of a thing with like this guy's a doctor, and I was thinking to say, 
I'm not sure what William does, but I wonder if there's a thing of like, well, I don't want to interrupt his actually important stuff with like mm-hmm. my petty thing, which is why don't we spend more time together? But meanwhile, uh-huh. like that's a real thing. I mean, time together is a major deal. It's a big currency in a relationship. Right. right? That's where the relationship happens in time right. together. So it it might seem like you in bringing this up to him are being like unreasonable or demanding of his time. But like, it's your time too. And you're in the relationship too. So I just think you can't be shy about being like, Hey, uh, I wish I could see you more, but I know Mm -hmm. how busy you are. I just wanted to tell you that and, and let you understand, like, I think it's occupying a little bit more space in my brain than maybe it is yours. Cause you are busy doing this thing, Mm -hmm. but I would love to see you more. And I'm wondering how that can happen. Mm. And I think too, because the problem is the more the longer you withhold that stuff, because maybe you're withholding because, quote, you don't want to bother him, but you're actually not having the real relationship. You're having this like half relationship where you tiptoe trying to keep the doctor, where it's like, tell him what you want, and you will quickly find out whether he's your person or not. As you said, Matt, it's like when you get the so. answer, like, and that's what you need to know. Don't be afraid of losing him and then as a result, not even like being real with him. Right. Yeah. And so you might as well just like tell him what it is. And I think too. Do you want a partner or a phantom? Exactly. And like this, like, or like, okay, well, I think he's going to come over. Let me not bother him. And like, just we'll do that. But I think too, that, you know, a couple things to remember. One, like you can ask somebody for something without being demanding, right? So much of this is in the delivery. So you saying, I wish I could see you more does not have to become this histrionic. Where are you? Do you like me? Right. So you, you, and and also the way you spoke, even just in this voicemail, like you sound pretty like direct. He seems like a sweet guy. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, you don't, you're not coming off like cray cray. So it's like, you know how to communicate in a, in a direct way. I think also then the other thing too is like, um, oh, I was going to say like, don't, Oh, I think I might have lost it. But I think it's more like... But that's what I was saying. Run, I, w- I was kidding about the improv stuff. But I meant, like, run these things through in your head until you know what you want to say in a, the most articulate way so that you have it down so you can just say, hey, the, this is what I want. I'm not demanding it. Mm-hmm. This is just what I want. And so you know it so you're not, like, flustered in the moment. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I see. What, no, no, I totally know what you're saying. But I also think it's my thing, too, with him. Is like, Oh, I know what it is, too. It's like... um. This person who went to medical school and is now a doctor, you ain't the first person to tell him he was too busy. Yeah, right. So, like, what you're asking for is not wild. That's the other thing, too. It's like, this is not going to be an out-of-left-field question, concern, conversation. So, remember that, too. Don't think that, like, you're going to be the first guy who wanted something. But the most important thing is that he says something because this is also it's early in the relationship and you don't want to set a tone for the relationship and for yourself where you're the you're the person in the relationship who is not saying what they feel because that means you're not being your full self. So this actually is a big test. And I actually think while we weren't able to answer your question about how to communicate, like we're, and we're, all we're saying is basically just communicate. That's actually a big deal. And yeah. that is something I think to take from yeah the, from the question being asked yeah or you must you communicate to, did you go to therapy are you somebody like i started to... therapy for myself this year and it's oh, been a wow. huge deal and and like actually this is one of the things because i was having a really hard time with someone i was dating earlier in the year because i felt like things had changed and i just wanted cl- uh, clarity on what it was and I was like in tears all the time about Mm. like you know feeling like I wasn't good enough and um how things had changed and like I I was just confused and my therapist said you need to tell him how you feel and I did and my entire emotional life got better like Mm -hmm. it was just it's just about communicating because you're never ever ever gonna look back at being honest in the grand scheme in the long run and think I shouldn't have been honest Like, cause in in the immediate aftermath, like what's the worst thing that can happen? Like you say to this guy, Hey, here's my concerns. And he said, he, he reacts really badly and is like, I don't think we can do this. Then you didn't want to be with that person. Exactly. Exactly. You saved everybody some time. Just being honest will always lead to some, a better situation in the long run. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Even if it's uncomfortable in the moment. What prompted you to go into therapy now? 
what prompted me to go into therapy was um, after I shot the series that I'm on, I knew it was coming out really, really soon, and it was going to be combined with the movie coming out. And I could feel that things were going to start getting um, very public. And I felt like I was going to be out there a lot, like to be perceived, like in this movie, in this show, out as myself, like promoting it. And I just, I wanted to make sure that I stayed like in a grounded spot that I could just talk about the real things that I was feeling day to day instead of like, you know, allowing myself to get caught up in like something stupid potentially. You know what I mean? Glitz and glamour. Yeah, it's not, and, and the thing is, like, there really isn't a lot of glitz and glamour. It's more about <laughs> like being being um, really caught up in the type of attention you're getting from people. Someone who is like obsessed with, um, like, uh, you know, I didn't. I wanted to manage like the online ness of it all, the um, accessibility to people's opinions. I just wanted to stay emotionally healthy, and mm-hmm. so I had like threatened myself. And my friends for years, like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I never did it. And I said, I'm going to go through enough of a life change right now where I think it's time. So, That's so smart. That's yeah, so it, smart. It was good. It was good. Yeah. Well, it's the reason why I asked that, too, even just when you're in therapy is because, you know, Matt's one of those people who, like, gets along with his parents, you know, and they're, like, friends and stuff. <laughs> so sometimes those people are like, I'm like you kind of grew up in a healthy household where people loved you. So I didn't know if you even You liked. know what's funny? <laughs> like, my therapist keeps sort of bringing up my parents in a way where she thinks, like, something is going to unlock and I'm going to, like, really want to go there. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm kind of good in that area. <laughs> like, but it's so funny because, like, you can feel the therapist, like, wanting to take it there. And, yeah. like, of course you can always go there with your parents. You know what I mean? Right, like, right. Like, genuinely like i could be in therapy just for those relationships like of course yeah but but i don't it's not top of mind for me yeah it's like it's and and, but i can feel the therapist like because i think that probably that is the root of a lot of people's stuff well and maybe even mine but like but you can i can feel her taking it there and sometimes like i'm hesitant to go there because i'm like i don't know that that's necessarily it then again i don't know better than her so I, you know. but you know better than her. Like you know, I was gonna say is your therapist Teal Swan, okay? Because Teal Swan is obsessed with everyone's parents being evil. Like her whole thing is like your parents hurt you, and people are like, okay, I guess that's what happened. You know? Yeah, like, and I mean for sure that is true, but it's just like I wonder if it's like productive every single time to like harp on that. You know? It's not. I think the thing though is that like all parent, you're gonna have come away from like all parental relationships, no matter how good they are, with like small t traumas, just because you're yeah. different humans and they had authority over you for two decades yeah. or whatever. Yeah, and right? when you so realize that they're not perfect and exactly. that they're human beings and they're fallible and they've made a ton of fallible decisions when it relates right. to you, right. like. That is a mind fuck, and it's also you know there's a lot of stuff with them aging, and then you becoming the responsible part uh, party. Oh it's it's, it's yeah. I know, yeah. I know, I know, I know. But yeah, it's like, but it's also sometimes like because I feel that way too because I started with a new therapist a couple months ago where I'm like, we don't need to spend all this much time on my family, love my parents, just because not only because I have done therapy in the past, but I'm like. It doesn't help me to talk about people who can't speak for themselves. You're just hearing my side of things, and it's like we know they did their best. We know they did their best. Let's pivot. Let's deal with like the more present issue. Well, yeah, but I think right. the thing in those cases is to figure out what the behaviors are that, that that they created and then how to change those behaviors. Right? Yeah, how to change them, but like you don't but as you said, how to change them as opposed to just like they did this to me. Yes. yes. With ending there is not enough. Just right. to be like, oh, it's because of this thing that happened. It's like no more wire hangers. And it's like, well, okay, what are you gonna what do we do now with that right. information? Right. 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 But that's the important part of the talk. Like yes. no matter how good your relationship is with your parents, the point of talking about that stuff is to figure out what the dialectic is and then how to like change it and how to like actively change. It. Right. But I do think it's funny though, because you know like Matt, like when therapists are very much like, What did your mother do? What did your mother say? You know what I mean? They're waiting mm-hmm. for that Freudian moment. And sometimes <laughs> you're like, can we just actually talk about this friendship right now that is <laughs> stressing me the fuck out? Yeah. 
Yeah. And then sometimes, but, too, it's like, you know there's something there. And so you're like, I can't get into this right now. Because that actually <laughs> is when therapy is really hard. It's like, you know, I can't <laughs> dredge this up. I oh, know. I like that. That's when I'm like, you're earning your money now. <laughs> We're not yeah. just like, ta- I'm just like, mm, I didn't get this overall deal or whatever <laughs> fucking shit people are talking about in this town. Yeah. You know, then it's like, oh, yes, finally, you are like, you know, you're using your side D. For yeah, real. to get in there. Oh, love a side D. <laughs> I got a side D, but now I got to get somebody to give me the medicine. I, I want one person who does it all, quite frankly. Okay, I want an MD PhD. Same, 100%. <laughs> a okay. one stop shop. Exactly. Okay, who's this next one, Andy? All right. Yeah, this is a little more difficult. Hi, Andy and Naomi. Um, sorry, my biggest fear is like calling strangers on the phone. So, gonna power through. Um, I. I don't even know if I know what my question is. Um, basically, I'm I'm started going back to school for nursing. I'm at a community college right now, so basically, everyone in my class is, is like 19 or 20 years old. Um, and I met this classmate of mine. Um, just we would like study together and stuff. And basically, like over the course of the semester. Um, it became very clear that, like, she was in a really bad marriage and, like, her husband was, like, abusing her, um, and then in ways that were both getting, like, the abuse was getting worse and it was, it was more clear, like, she was sharing more with me, um, and just because of, like, her situation, like I don't know she's just been through so much shit but she's like very self-aware she like knows like she knows the position she's in and she um honestly just like can't can't leave him right now they have three kids um she's basically the only one who does any parenting um but she's also scared that if she leaves she would lose custody of her kids Hmm. um which, like, there's a whole story, too, but, like, there's honestly, like, a good chance she wouldn't wouldn't have custody of her kids. Um, but she's also told me, and this is, like, stuff I've in- invited to, but also, like, someone in that situation, they're very, like, desperate to, to share with people sometimes, especially someone who, in her case, she told me, like, she doesn't have many friends left, She's had to tell our professor a lot of these personal things, too, um, just to explain, like, why she couldn't come to class or something. And I'm just like, what, like, not what do I do in terms of fixing it? Because I know I can't. But I'm like, how do I, like, live with knowing this and, like, being a friend when I'm really, like, a support person? Okay, love you guys. I don't know if that makes sense. Bye. I thought this was interesting in the sense that it wasn't a typical. It's like <laughs> if some someone you are friends with is going through something really fucked up, uh, and you have no control. How do right. you? What do you? How do you emotionally deal with it? That's what I thought was the interesting right. question. Yeah, those are really really tough friendships to be in, yeah. um, because obviously you want to do everything you can, but it's just not your place. Right. Um, uh, unfortunately, I think that this person has to get their own help. Um, and that all that you can really do, caller, is keep being a friend. And um, But I will say, you sound like you've really internalized a lot of it. Um, and you have to check in with yourself that you are okay. Because you sound extremely nervous and upset. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, I know. I, I just I, I would say to the caller, my advice to you is to maybe in, pursue like an outlet that you can talk about this and manage it and like see what it's bringing out in you. And I just because it sounds like you're very upset about something that you clearly like care much care very much about. But um, ultimately, there is nothing you can do. Right. Right. I know you sound yeah because what I was thinking was what I was getting from her is like she just sounded weary like I was like you sound broke down like she, you sound like sounds, this thing has gotten you I mean she did not sound good right it was just like who like you know like broke down by this whole thing and so it's like 
and I think that, and we've said this uh, in the past, you know, when people talk about, you know, friends who are in these situations, like, because you, you can't control it and that, and you know that, mm. but it's true. What you can be is a lifeline so that yeah. when, and if this person is ever ready, because especially you've said that she says she doesn't have a lot of friends, you know, you are a person then that she can go, Hey, I'm ready to take some steps. Can you help yeah. me find those steps or reach out to people? Like, so you do want to uh, keep that door open, but you know, is it one of those things like, for instance, is are the nature of these conversations such where it's like you guys are studying and she brings it up in the middle of studying? Is it that you guys are talking and texting a lot outside of class? You know, kind of what is how is it coming out? Because I think that, you know, for instance, when you're obviously she needs to get it out, she needs an outlet. But I think you can maybe try and put some boundaries on when she's letting it out for you. Like, for instance, like when you, if y'all get together to study. It's like, okay, we just got to focus for two hours and like, let's do the work we came here to do. And then maybe on the other side, it's like, okay, do you want to talk for a little bit? Do you want to talk for half an hour before you go back home or before you do whatever? But it can't be like, let's start studying. And then we spend the whole study session talking about your, the problem you're having. I mean, it's it's that. Yeah. And that's unfortunate that, that uh, I think our caller has become like the sounding board for it because really the person that, that that they should be talking to about all this is like someone that does like have like specialty in this and can help them and i think that that's what's hard about the situation is it's like this person is confiding and like even saying like you know it's getting worse Mm -hmm. you know like saying so many things but like you know the caller is not an expert like and the, the caller is um internalizing a lot of stress and like um like in a way internalizing some of the abuse because it's like she hasn't, she, she doesn't have a healthy way of coping with it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's just this whole, this whole dynamic is not healthy. And so you just wish that the person that's, that's the victim of the abuse would um, be able to just leave, but it doesn't sound like they're currently ready to do that. So maybe one thing I could say that's actionable is just like, like if it if it's at a certain point in the conversation where it's getting really clear the person is like in a lot of danger, like maybe have some resources there at the ready that you can like pass along to them and be like, I've been thinking a lot about what you've been saying, and here are some resources. I'm sure you've looked into them already, but I want you to know that I think it's this bad. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like I don't think it's normal. Right. But have have either of you? By the way, Matt, uh, for someone who just started therapy, you have the. You have the language and the con- the conceptual stuff <laughs> sort like of down. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, I so just that- I just always I'm very sensitive to when people all of a sudden have are racked with emotion about something that is not their life. Like this is not your life. Um and I understand that there's a lot of other people that you're going to class with that are that seem like they're they're not your age, and maybe you've connected with someone who's more your age, and you know, um, it it feels good to make that connection. But the fact is, like, um, you can't save this person. Like, they have to help themselves. They have to save themselves. And I just was concerned in the tone of voice that the, mm-hmm. I mean, the, I would have thought for sure the caller was going to say something was going on in her own life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, we, we have an empathy chain going on here, right? Yeah. Right. The caller is empathetic to her friend. We are all empathetic to the caller. So it's all like kind of transferring down. Right. But have, have either of you, because I, I think the, the core though is like, she knows this. She, I think she knows she can't really do anything. I, I like the, um, I like the idea that she should have like information at the ready. Like here's a women's shelter that I, I know is a good shelter. Here's blah, blah, blah. Right. Whatever. Here's a, a, a phone number you can call. Um, but when you have had friends who are going through difficult things and you're empathizing with them, right. Besides drawing boundaries or besides like giving them information, what have you done personally to kind of just recharged or what have you done to like emotionally I don't mean wall yourself off it's not well, like the cask of Amontillado in your brain but it's like <laughs> this what is have another you done yeah this is another reason why I started therapy though because my boundaries with friends are often like not great like and sometimes I will I'll wake up and I'll be like why am I upset oh something that doesn't have to do with me mm. and I'll be like or like I'll be very like um 
I don't know. I'm very empathetic and like very much like a like a like a water sign in this way where it's just like if someone is upset, like I will take it on. And mm. I just I've noticed that that doesn't serve me at all and never will. Um and being there for a friend and listening is different than internalizing. And you do not have to internalize to be there. Mm-hmm. You don't. You really don't. In fact, like the worst thing you can do is internalize so much that you then become another like weak pillar in that person's life. You know what I mean? Like I, that like like yeah. something something that I think I would caution people against is like, you know, just w- being so available to the point where you then are feeling those feelings. If if you're starting to feel that stress, then it might be time for you to take a step back. And maybe that sends a message. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, I, I, like, honestly, it could get to the point where it's just like, I am hearing what you are saying, and I want you to know it has bothered me so much to the point where I think about it a lot. And I think that what you need to do is you need to f- explore an option, which is talking to someone who can offer you real help, because I am getting to the point where not only do I am I n- unable to offer you help, but I'm feeling like dispirited and demoralized as a result of it, and I don't want to be that type of en- energy around you. Yeah. Like, it's okay to tell people that you're wearing down. Yeah. Yeah. I was also thinking, too, because I think that's right, too, because especially what you said to me, like, I don't want to be that energy around you. Not like, you're really bumming me out. It's like, no, it's just I want to be here for you, and I can't be here for you feeling this way. And I think like that's it's a hopeless. very nice way to put it. Exactly. But then also, right. too, one thing that she said in the call, too, was that she's even talked to their teacher, their professor about this stuff. Right. Because she's like, hey, this is why I haven't come to class, et cetera, et cetera. You know, this is where, for instance, you're in nursing school right now. So you're around people who are predisposed to be helpers and people who want to do that kind of thing. Yes, there's there's no way there aren't resources at that school. And that the, meaning like just contacts with people like, you know, especially community college where you are getting people who are like coming from different backgrounds and like lifestyles. Like some people, again, maybe 1920, some people got lives and jobs and, you know, families. So it's like mm-hmm. there are maybe things there because, yes, there's this concern about having your kids. But yeah, there's again, the custody concern. But if you are being abused by somebody, they ain't giving that person kids. You, that you hold on you don't know that we don't know that definitely but i think instead of saying like well i can't have my kids we don't know what the we don't know what the the problem but then she also is. said in the like call she also said in the call she was something. like but she would never lose her kids like she she even said that in the call she was like she's worried about losing her kids but but she would also never lose her kids like she said that in the call i don't know to be honest with you there is too much going on here that we don't know right in order to give a real i know i know I, I, and I think that all I can say to the caller, who sounds really upset, that this is something that she needs to now assess as, in, in how it's taking up space in her life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah. sucks because like I think the thing is, yeah. when when you hear stuff like that, your first thought is something like, uh, but I care. You know, I'm not a sociopath. I care about it. But it's just like, okay, but like you have no control in the situation you have no power none right and you might make it worse yeah yeah like by offering some piece of advice or like some sort of action or being like i'm coming there with you like like you may make it worse yeah right because you're also hearing while this is like a victim's perspective and like like this is your friend's perspective you still are only hearing one perspective and seeing one aspect of the situation you could go over there and like you know th- like it c- it could be an actual dangerous situation right this guy could have a fucking gun right yeah you don't know. exactly you don't know where you're like going. like yeah. it's it's i think it's just be a friend be a responsible friend be emotionally healthy yourself and be available to her when she wants to make a change yeah yeah is alanon a possibility is that that's exactly what someone like this should be exploring yeah possibly possibly just throwing that out there yeah if if it if it it yeah if it becomes a major issue like i have friends in al-anon and they say that it was like imperative to their rehabilitation emotionally because they did not understand how much they were shouldering Mm -hmm. and and didn't understand that 
it wasn't normal to be holding all that. Right, 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 right. Okay, you know what, Matt? Quite honestly, you might be a third therapist. <laughs> or a therapy because you really are coming here with the real. You are being direct, and you are st- being very empathetic. But you're really I actually, coming here. But I actually think things are often a lot more simple than we think. Like it's like mm-hmm. it's like you you have to go out into the world every day as a healthy, positive individual in order to be productive. So what can you do to make that happen? That affects on uh, affects other people too. You know what I mean? Like. But it might not be in the best interest of this girl to keep going there and being like, what happened now? You know yeah. what I mean? Like, it, it, it mm-hmm. might not be in anyone's best interest. Do you know what it is, Matt? It, it's, it feels like if you're an empathetic person, that um, part of that is like, well, I have to be a martyr then. It does not mean to, suffering alongside. Right. It does not. But that's what I'm saying. But that, but that is, I yeah. think that is part of that uh, of in in people's heads i know it's part like in my head there's this thing where i'm just like well if i don't like here's this is the very dumbest version right but if it's like i'm like trying to like write a script or something like that and it's blazing hot and i can't think but i'm like if i turn on the air conditioner i'm destroying the earth oh god and then well this is again this is the dumb dumb little version but my brain is just like it's okay andy you're to turn on the air conditioner for an hour while you type so that you can actually think it's okay to do that. You don't have to be a martyr for every single thing. Well, yeah, it's put your mask on before helping someone else. Yeah. They literally are out here like put it on before you even help the baby. The baby will figure it out. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like it's always like put, you will not live. And then that, it don't matter. But that's actually brain, a great example. That's a yeah. great example of like put the mask on before you can help your baby. Someone who's depending on you actually cannot be helped unless you are okay. Like right. if you are not breathing, you cannot help someone else breathe. Like yeah. and that's actually that's actually some that's like a perfect analogy for this situation. It's like you don't sound well. So you actually can't help like this. Mhm. But my brain does this calculus where it's like, well, if you turn that on for an hour, you've just destroyed the earth, right? It's the same. I think I'm saying that there's that martyr complex that comes along with empathy sometimes. Yeah. And that it's very difficult. I think that's the difficult thing to overcome. And also, well, the line between, as you said, like, I want to be there. But also, I'm not. This is not for me to shoulder because I think it's easy because you think like, well, if I put a boundary, does that make me an asshole? Right, that's the yes, thing. No. It's, that's like, what you're it's exactly. like, am I a bad person By for saying for saying like there is a limit to? I've, I have no control over this. I am going to be here for you, but there is a limit to what I I can personally deal take with. In, yeah. And I think that is a difficult. I think that's the psychologically difficult thing in these kinds of cases, because you're like, because you people don't want to think of themselves as bad people, and then they do this kind of like calculus in their head where they're like well if i'm not totally there for this person then i'm a bad person and i don't want to be a bad person so i will totally be there for this person even if it hurts me right right and i think that is one of the the i think that is the difficult thing to overcome Mm -hmm. in this and also your own sense of powerlessness in these kinds of situations right there it is there it is (laughs) there it is my goodness Damn. He's a culturista, and he's a therapista, and he's a therapista. I I, en- I enjoy therapy. You know what I mean? Like I really, I really like it. I'm going again tomorrow, and I'm I get excited about it because even when I don't feel like I have something to talk about or something like I'm really emotionally wrecked up with, we always find something. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I it's also you, you know what the thing about therapy is too. Like sort of in this same vein, it's like when you are in a conversation with a friend or someone that you have a relationship with outside of therapy, like it's not just you in the conversation with a therapist. It's kind of a space just for you. Yes. And it's someone reacting to what you're saying, who is not weighing in and being like, Oh my God, girl. Yes. And this happened with me as well. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It's like yeah. some, and, and then you, you don't have to spin off and like do that. Like, it's really important to look at yourself emotionally in a vacuum because that's the only time you can get actual emotional exercise and actually understand how it is that you feel and why is because you're not gauging someone else's response uh, in terms of their experience. You know what I mean? Like, yes, yes, Not yes, to yes, say yes. like go in and be a dick to your therapist, but like it doesn't <laughs> actually matter how they feel. 
yes. about what you right, said. Right, 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 right. You know? Yeah, you're not being like, is this weird? Is this weird? You know, the yeah. way you talk to a friend to kind of be like, have you been in a similar situation? Or as you said, you go off on that conversation. Right. So I think, yeah, 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 totally. No, no, this, you need it. We all need it. Everyone needs that time to like look within and get right and yeah. get and honest. I was the last person person to sign up for it truly like out of everyone i knew like they were like you need it and i was like okay i hate that you say that to me like etc but i did need it you know what i mean and now it's like now the way i talk about it i'm such an advocate for it like i've been doing it since i was a child but i'm not but i but i wish i had i wish i had wait why were you resistant earlier um why was i resistant earlier time uh, not feeling like I wanted to date a therapist, not wanting to like have to like 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 the person or like you know I, I thought it was going to be a lot more difficult to uh, find someone I liked, the relationship I liked, and like I did. Um, I think honestly, just like maybe I was a little bit subconsciously nervous about doing it. Maybe I didn't want to feel like I was alone with myself for that amount of time, um, which is crazy because I love to talk. Um, <laughs> But I think, yeah, time and anxiety about finding the right person. Yeah. Well, so you're just like, you just seem so mature to me now. You just really seem to have matured. You, you know? Since, what, since last time we engaged? <laughs> well, just, I mean, I think, I mean, I don't know. It's interesting, again, when you see somebody, you know somebody or see them over, for over years, right? Where it's like, I haven't yeah. been in it, but I've seen your response to it. Mm -hmm. And so, and even as you said, even as even from the beginning, when you talk about you're like, I went through this time of just randoms and showing up, and now I want to have a conversation first. Yeah, now I yeah, want to be yeah. a little bit more. It just sounds like what it is is I'm hearing just a general mindfulness. Like you yeah. want to be a little more aware of what you're stepping into, whether that is a night with a random or suddenly becoming like going on a fucking publicity tour. It's like, you what know, am I getting into? I think too, it's just as you get a little bit older, like you're just so much more conscious of your time and how it's best spent. And lately yeah. I actually am loving my time by myself. I think I was really busy like all throughout the year and it's a very social thing what we do. And it's really like, a lot, lot relying on like appearing and appearing as like the type of person that um, people expect. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I genuinely something I talk about in therapy is when I'm being like myself, Matthew, and when I'm being like Matt Rogers. You know what I mean? And like doing the thing and being like, yeah. you know, always having something to say about this topic <laughs> or that. You know what I mean? Like I, I don't think so, honey. And like you know what I mean? All this stuff and Matt and Bowen and you know what I mean? Like all these things. Like it's like that is not who I am. At, the, in, at for real you know right. what I mean like and so right. and so it's interesting to like you know I don't know it's just interesting and it is why I got into therapy it's just about balancing what people expect and what you expect of yourself and to be able to do versus what you're actually able to do and what you what what your um, shortcomings are what your anxieties actually are or what you, you know want what I mean? to do there's what people expect and what you actually want and sometimes it's not on the same it's not at the same time and I also think sometimes when you are better with yourself, the character actually becomes clearer. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like so from when, when I feel good, like being myself, Matthew, like I actually feel like Matt Rogers is better because it's like, you know what I mean? Like it's not everything, you know, mm -hmm. like, like it's confusing sometimes. Yeah. Well, what is the not to act between? like I'm fucking Hannah Montana, but, when I'm, <laughs> but a, any 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 person who is a brand like and when like you Naomi Perrigan like Annie Beckerman like you guys put out there a certain image mm -hmm. and like when you do this podcast you you put out a certain image and then when you turn the podcast off there is probably a lot of the same stuff but there's different stuff there there is stuff that you wouldn't share there's stuff yeah. I wouldn't share right and I think that also like when you get success for being the person who shares and when yep. you become successful for being the transparent person yep. and the person that we feel like we know that can get to the place where, yep. okay, yeah, maybe I'll start therapy now. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yep. I mean, our audience yep. knows our hard boundaries. We're like, okay, there's going to be stuff we don't talk about there. But for you, like, what is the tension? What is that kind of space between Matt Rogers and Matthew that, <sighs> that, that you are trying to navigate? I think that I think that like sometimes it can be hard to present as an extrovert so intensely because you need rest too. You know what I mean? Like yeah. extroverts and people who are like very out there and like you know present as a um uh you know 
outgoing, friendly, bubbly, energetic person, like you'd be surprised how tired you get. And I yes. think something I didn't realize like over the past six months is how tired I was. Like mm. I got so sick at the end of this big, big, big press tour that we did for, it was like, I love that. It was like, we shot I Love That For You and then we pre- premiered and promoted that and then Fire Island came out and we were promoting that and that was like a big press thing. Like we were yeah, really out yeah. there. And my, the whole time I'm still doing the podcast and doing some live shows, etc. to the point where like I finally um over 4th of July w- week went to Fire Island just for vacation, which is not a relaxing time anyway. <laughs> not chill. And I like was partying every day and then all of a sudden my body just completely shut down. My bo- yeah. I, and I got really sick. And I was like, you know what? I think my body is literally telling me, shut up. (laughs) Yeah. And I never say that to myself. And so now, honestly, for the rest of the summer, like I didn't go out last night. It was Saturday night. Like Friday night, Greta and I had a show. We went out to dinner afterwards. That was it. Like I'm okay just turning off. Yeah. And I feel like I used to think I could never turn off. Or people Mm. would like forget or to be disappointed or like whatever, but like uh, it's totally. okay. Like, especially when uh-huh. like, you know, people really feel like they know you and have an idea of you. It's actually okay sometimes to feel like you're pulling back from that because you're not necessarily that all the time. Like, right. I don't know. It's just about like, like actually being responsible with your energy, which sometimes means turning it all the way down. Mm-hmm. That's kind of where I'm at right now. Hmm, and my yeah. therapist said to me, like I even said to my therapist, I was like, you know, this week there's nothing on my schedule and I'm so excited about it. And she said, add nothing. She was like, that's my challenge to you. Add nothing. She was like, okay. if, if you're in a place where like you've worked really hard, like we, you do what we do, it's not like a nine to five situation. Um, like, and, but like I, I feel good right now. Like I was excited about a week off. She was like, don't you add one thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Because you need that. You yep. need that. And yeah. everyone needs that. And that's, I guess, that relates me back to the second caller, is you sound so tired. <laughs> you sound yeah. so tired and upset. Yeah. Like, I, I worry about you. Like, I, 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 as much as, like, we're worried about the person in question, like, you know, my my response in listening to, to that voicemail was to be like, oh, my God, this girl doesn't sound good. Yeah. She sounds uh-huh. like she's having a real hard time. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm also going to make sure to check in with you on Wednesday and be like, you still didn't add anything? You still didn't add anything? Because I can see you going 72 hours and then start itching a little bit, itching a little bit, like, shit, I got to do something. I go two I hours and start. I know. Like, there's, you know yeah. there's a two-hour block of freedom here. and I, I know. I, I, with nothing, and I'm, uh. I okay. used to be like that. I used to be like, I mean, you know, y'all know what it's like to live in New York when you're, like, on the hustle, on the grind. It's like, if you don't have five things in your schedule for any given day, it's like you failed. Yeah. And then you move to LA, and that becomes, like, two things but it's still there you still feel an obligation to action Um, and so now it's just like now it's like I'll be honest with you like I look at that free time like like something I have to have on my schedule like I will sit here and watch old seasons of the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills and I'll be like no this was good I needed this (laughs) right that's your recharge you needed to recharge truly though like can I quick ask yes ask quick you as your public persona are weary and you as your private persona are weary. So what is the tension for you? Well, I think that has actually also been a, um, not fully conscious, but I think it's been something that has helped me because my, when I first started doing stand up, it was not, Oh, I'm so weary. I'm so old. My early stand up was like, I went on a date with this man from Craigslist and he out of his damn mind. Like I, it was, I was younger, but certainly it was about that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think as I, I also noticed, you know, I used to just carry so much shame around who I was as a person, being depressed, feeling like I was lazy, feeling like, oh, I ate too much, or all these kind of things. And I noticed that when I put it on stage, that's where the biggest laughs would come from. Yeah. And, and it was, there, nothing made me feel less shameful than putting it out there. Mm. So that's why I started to pivot to that, because it was almost like a, it, was, it was a weird self-help in a way. And so, but now it's just funny because it's like, in a way, I do have a, um, persona that kind of helps, but then I also have to be mindful too because I'm like, okay, I think I'm being 
too negative or I'm acting 30 years older than I need to be acting right now. Like there are times where I'll be like, why are you serving auntie? Like these are your peers, uh -huh. you know, and I'll do why that. Why are you serving auntie? And I'll do that. Great day for a special, by the way. Serving auntie. I, that's all serving I'll be auntie. And I'm, like, and I'm like, what am I doing? You know what I mean? Like I'll be like, you young people. It's like, okay, very much in the same generation honestly you know, I, yeah all the time all the time but it'll kind of help me sometimes like i remember you know when i remember that time like we ran into someone there was a neighbor and she said she was like oh naomi i saw you walking mabel and i was gonna say hi but then i remembered in your half hour when you said don't talk to me when i'm swagging so i didn't and in a way that's <laughs> that helpful so to funny. me <laughs> <laughs> you know and i'm like mm -hmm. Um, and I saw Sudi, Sudi Green recently too, where she goes, Naomi, I think about you saying, don't talk to me when I'm swinging all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, and so on one hand, it's like, in a way that helped me. So yes. People don't approach me in the morning, but I think I'm also like, well, I do want friends. I know. People. That's the thing. That, and that's the thing too, is it's just like, yeah. When you present a very extroverted thing, sometimes people come up and they, it's like a little too familiar. And, and, and that, that's, I guess why I also have to manage the whole thing of like, let me get to know you first is because like when you're too available and you're literally too available, <laughs> you can get into a dangerous spot. <laughs> so yeah, it's all, I, I'm learning. I, I'm getting yeah. better at it. And honestly, like I'm happy to be slowed down right now. And like I, my, because my year is going to get very busy again. And right. so right now I can see a window in time where I could just like sit around and like, you know, you know, hang. Yeah, watch, watch like the Real Housewives. Yeah, exactly. you need it. Yeah, Be you a dummy. It. And I've also, like, one thing I'm going to stop is I've given myself license over the past three or four days to, like, eat really bad. <laughs> and that should stop because it is a slippery slope. Because it's kind of giving early days of COVID in here. Like, I'm wearing the sweat. I'm wearing the same sweats. I'm watching the same reality show again and again and again. I'm eating bad. I'm like, okay, what did I? I got some free time and it's like I'm in lockdown. It's like, yeah. I'm not. I'm free to go. And I should be. I should go. Matt, we never left the early days of COVID. Yeah, that's the we problem. Are, our that's apartment, the problem, we are living though. in that space. And that's no. why I'd be taking naps every day. And that's not good. You know, I could be getting a lot more accomplished. So I'm on a nap now. Uh, you've earned it, honey. You've done two podcasts back to back. And it's Lord's <laughs> Day. So yeah, you real taxing. <laughs> you take a nap. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you guys for having me. I always love hanging. You're the best. And I'm so glad that you are doing well and you better just rest up this week. So help me, God. Honestly, I'm going back to New York on Wednesday and I'm going to the Chromatica Ball, Lady Gaga's concert on Thursday night. So no rest for the wicked. <laughs> Oh my god. All right, you guys. We'll see you next week. Bye. For over 20 years, Google has been protecting Americans from cybersecurity threats. From turning two step verification on by default for 150 million people, which adds an additional layer of account security with a single tap to protecting news sites and human rights organizations with Project Shield. Google is building advanced technologies that raise the bar for the entire industry and makes the whole Internet safer for everyone. Learn more about how Google is keeping more Americans safe online than anyone else at safety.google.